want to come to you today, Lord, and pray that you will send your Holy Spirit now, Lord, to guide us. We say to you, Holy Spirit, that you're welcome in this place. Lord, we want you to come now, Holy Spirit, and that you will feel welcome, Lord, in this place, Lord, because we want you here with us. We want you to guide us, Father. We want you to guide us, Holy Spirit, into all truth. You said that, Jesus, you said that you would send your Holy Spirit, your counselor, your comforter, Lord, to guide us into all truth. So we pray this this morning, Lord, that you will send your Holy Spirit now, Lord, as we spend some time uh, studying your word and reading your word, Father. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, you know, sometimes when you preach, you're not sure whether what you're preaching is the right thing. And is it, is it not on? Yeah, sometimes when you get up to preach, you're not sure whether what you think is the right thing to preach, and you're not sure about it. But uh, two things, two scriptures have already been mentioned by Ayo this morning as he was doing the workers' meeting. So I'm pretty sure that what God is trying to say to us today is the right thing, and that what I've got down. Because the subject that I want to talk about today is the power of prayer and fasting. And also, there was also a scripture that Vesta also mentioned on Friday um, at the Throne of Grace, which was about uh, Joel, a scripture that we'll look at later. And that was also another confirmation that uh, what I'm talking about today is the right thing. So uh, to start with, my wife um, says that I need to tell more jokes. So <laughs> uh, I don't think she's in at the moment. I think she's gonna. But, um, so we'll start off with a joke, uh, to start with. Um, so last night, I, I had a dream, and I died that, and I went to heaven. And I was standing there at the um, pearly gates outside, and the archangel Gabriel was there to greet me. And he said to me, he said that you, you've accepted the Lord Jesus as your Savior and Lord, so we're going to let you in. He said, but he said, first of all, You've got to write down all your sins that you've ever committed in your whole life. So he gave me a big piece of chalk this, this long. And before me was a big a blackboard and it was stretching up right up into the heavens. So I started to write down all my sins and, and the things that I've done wrong in my life. And then I began to run out of room and I was, I was walking along this blackboard. I, I noticed that there was a ladder. Uh, propped up against this blackboard and it was also stretching up right up into the heavens as far as I could see So I was beginning to run out of room. So I was just about to uh, Get onto the first rung of the ladder and as I'm stretching up I f There's this This foot comes and places it onto my hand and as I looked up I realized it was my wife coming back down for more chop <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> She didn't know I was going to tell that one, so maybe someone wants to tell her about it later. <laughs> so anyway, um, the, the first scripture that I want us to look at is Matthew 6, um, verse 16 to 18. This is a, I think we've already had this scripture. This is one of the ones that we read earlier, but I think we should read it again. So that's Matthew 6, verse 16 to 18. So it says there, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may, may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you don't appear to be fasting. But your Father who is in the, sees you in the secret place, and your Father who sees you in the secret place will reward you openly. And this is a scripture that I read earlier. And so it says that we are to fast. You know, as Christians, it's not an option that we should fast. Sometimes we should fast, and we're in the middle of uh, praying and fasting at the moment as a church. And so there are times that we should fast. We don't have um, a set time as Christians when we should fast. We don't, we're not like the, uh, the Muslims who have Ramadan when they fast uh, for a month. 
Uh, but you know, we should be led by the Holy Spirit, and if uh, the leader or the pastor of the church feels that we we should have a time of prayer and fasting, as we are now, then we should spend some time praying and fasting at that time. So we don't have like a set time, but I think it's actually it's better that way because. Like with the Pharisees, they would fast and they would make sure that everybody knew about it. And as Christians, when we fast, we should make sure that everybody doesn't know about it. And that when we fast, if it's possible, as much as it's possible on our own, we should make sure that people don't know that we're fasting. Because Jesus says that we can lose our reward, we should do it in secret. You know, and sometimes um, I've worked with Muslims and at Ramadan, they will all sit round in the canteen and nobody's eating and everybody knows why they're not eating and it's almost like it's done in a public way and I believe that you know as Jesus said they will they've had their reward because they're not doing it for the right reasons so that when we pray and we fast and we seek God we should make sure that it's done in a secret place and it's done you know in a way that other people don't know about it so as I said praying and fasting is required and there's some things that in our lives that we can only get a breakthrough uh, through prayer and fasting there might be a difficult situation in your life maybe something that you've had for many years that you've struggled with and you're looking for a breakthrough in that area of your life and it might be that the only way you can get a breakthrough in that area is through prayer and fasting so there is a price to pay it's not easy to fast you know it's not easy to, to be hungry, but you know, as Christians, we're called to make sacrifices. And we are, uh, we are called to, you know, uh, sacrifice our own desires and our own natural desires sometimes. And another scripture that I would like us to look at, this is another scripture that was also mentioned already this morning by uh, Aya, which is Daniel 10. Uh, that's Daniel 10, verse 1 to 15. If we could uh, turn to that, please. So it says there, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message, and he had understanding of the vision. In those days, Daniel was mourning for three full weeks. He ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into his mouth, nor did I anoint myself till those three whole weeks weeks were fulfilled. Now in the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and I looked and behold a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with a gold. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like the torches of fire, his, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in colour. And the sound of his words were like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision. But a great terror fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone when I saw this great vision. And no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned into frailty in me. And I retained no strength. Yet yeah, I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in deep sleep in my face to the ground. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. He said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for... From the first day that you set your heart to understand and, and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, heard, and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the king, kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I have been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen 
to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. When he had spoken these words to me, I turned for face towards the ground and I became speechless. So Daniel here has been fasting and praying for three weeks, for 21 days Daniel has been fasting and praying and he's been mourning for those 21 days and it says then that in verse 12 it says from the first day that he humbled himself the message and the answer was sent and yet that answer, that angel did not come to Daniel for 21 days because the angel was withheld, the angel was stopped from coming to bring the answer to Daniel. And I believe that many times in our own lives we have prayed for things and that answer was sent straight away. But because of what is happening in the heavenlies, in the heavenly realms, there, there was an unseen battle all around us. And so it might take three weeks for us to get an answer to prayer. Or it might take a few months to get an answer to prayer. Or it might take years to get an answer to prayer. But that answer has already been sent. And it's just that there is a, a battle in the heavenlies, an unseen battle in the heavenlies. And we don't get to see that battle very often. But we see a glimpse of it here. You know, the Bible doesn't talk about it that often. Uh, but there is another scripture that talks about this battle. If you uh, turn with me to Ephesians 6 and verse 12. That's Ephesians 6 verse 12. It says, Therefore we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual house of wickedness in the heavenly places. So there is an unseen battle that is going on all around us all the time. And we do not wrestle against people, we do not wrestle against atheists, we do not wrestle against unbelievers or liberal people. You know, these people are being used by powers, dark powers behind them might even not be aware of that, that they're being used in this way. So we are not to fight against people. If, we, if people want to get into arguments with us, we are not to fight back against them because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're not wrestling. We are not fighting against these people when we go out and evangelize on the streets and there are people that want to get into arguments. There are people that want to insult us and and say things to us and try and upset us. They might not even be aware that, but, but there's demonic spirits behind them uh, that are trying to attack us, that are trying to stop us as Christians living the right way. And so, you know, we're not to take it personally. If somebody insults me, people have said things to me when I've gone out to evangelize. And to be honest, it, it doesn't bother me. You know, it, it's just like water off a duck's back. I think I would be more upset if it was somebody from my family who insulted me, somebody that really knows me. But when it's somebody on the street, it doesn't, it doesn't really bother me, you know. And, and in fact, the more times it happens to you, the, the less it, it bothers you. I think you get used to it, and you get immune to it. Um, so I just want to give a, a personal testimony of something that happened uh, a few years ago. Uh, a few years ago, I was led to do some time of uh, prayer and fasting. And uh, I went for several days of praying and fasting and really seeking God. And when I told my wife about this, actually, she seemed to find uh, it hard to believe because she knows that I like my snap. But it, it's, it's actually true that I did do some, uh, you know, praying and fasting uh, for, for a number of days uh, some years ago. And at that time, while I was praying and fasting, to be honest, I don't think I saw really an answer to my prayers at that time. And one of the things that I was praying about was that uh, I would find a wife. You know, the Bible says that he that finds a wife finds a good thing. And that's one of the things that I was praying about at that time, that I would find the right person, the right person to be my wife. And a few uh, weeks after I did this praying and fasting, it was actually when me and Lorna started to talk on the internet 
and we started to chat on a, a Christian internet room and that's how we first started to get to, to know each other and then we, we were writing to each other, uh, we wrote some letters to each other and then through one thing or another we lost touch perhaps because of my uh, lack of faith or, or something like that, I'm not really sure why, but for about eight years we had no real contact and we lost touch with each other. And then one day, um, she sent me a friend's request on Facebook. And uh, you know, God, God can even use Facebook. Uh, <laughs> you know, Facebook gets a lot, gets a lot of stick and gets a lot of criticism sometimes. But you know, if, uh, if it wasn't for face, Facebook, probably me and Lorna would not be together now. Um, so we started talking and uh, to cut a long story short, about eight months after that, to, uh, well, first of all, I went to I went to see Lorna. She was working in uh, Macau, which is part of China at that time. And, and about eight months after that, we were married in the Philippines. Um, yeah, so, so the reason I'm sharing that testimony is is because looking at, at the natural, uh, you might say that I didn't didn't receive an answer to prayer at that time. You know, I could, I could have become discouraged, but the Holy Spirit reminded me recently that it was during that time of praying and fasting that it was, I believe that that was an answer to prayer, though it didn't happen straight away, and I had to, we had to wait for like eight years for it actually to be completely fulfilled. You know, I believe that there was a, a spiritual battle going on in the heavenlies, and there was principalities and powers that were, were trying to stop us uh, to get together, because I do believe that since... You know, we have been together. I think that together we have been stronger, you know, spiritually than, than we were apart. Um, so can we turn to Exodus uh, 34, verse 28? That's Exodus 34, verse It says there, this is talking about Moses. So he was there with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So this was actually the second time that Moses had gone back up onto Mount Sinai because the first tablets were broken. And it says there that he went up for 40 days and 40 nights. And he ate nothing, and he drank nothing. Now this must be a miracle because, you know, it's possible to go without food for maybe 50 plus days, but water, you cannot go without water for uh, maybe three or four days is the, is the maximum that anybody can survive without water. Yeah, it says here that Moses went without water for 40 days. So this must have been, been a miracle. And many years ago, I read a book which is called God's Chosen Fast, and it was about fasting. And if anybody feels led to, to fast and really be serious with God about fasting, I would encourage them to read this book because it inspired me to fast. And it, it's, it's, the book is called God's Chosen Fast, and it's by a guy called Arthur Wallace. And he talks about how he fasted for 21 days. And he says that after a few days, his um, desire for food um, started to disappear. Now, that might have been might have been his experience, uh, and I'd wish it, it had been my experience, but I can honestly say for me, I was as hungry on, on the last day as I was on the first day. <laughs> um, I was a little bit disappointed at that one, actually. Um, so, yeah, so if, if you know, you feel like God's speaking to you about fasting, it's a, it's, that is definitely a book that would be worth reading. Uh, let us look at uh, Matthew 17 and verse 14. That's Matthew 17, verse 14. This is a story that many of us are probably familiar with. It says, And, and when they came to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he is an epileptic and he suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. 
So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered them and said to them, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? Uh, how shall I bear with you? Bring me, bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, because I surely I say to you, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and you will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. So Jesus is saying here, there are some things that cannot happen unless we pray and fast. There are some miracles in our lives, and there are some miracles that can only happen through prayer and fasting. And so if there's something in your life that maybe you've been struggling with for years, and you cannot get a breakthrough in that area, and you really need a breakthrough in that area of your life, it might be that God is calling you to have a time of prayer and fasting in, in your life, that God wants to break something in your life, that God wants to break something maybe in your family's life, and that can only be broken through prayer and fasting. You know, because there are things that can oppress us, even as Christians, that can stop us from doing God's will, and God can only get a breakthrough sometimes through prayer and fasting, because there is... There is power in that because when you when you pray and fast to God, you're basically saying that you're getting serious with God. You're saying, I'm so serious about this God that I, I'm going to go without food. I'm going to go without these things in my life that I'm going to put you first. I really want you to do something in my life. You know, and that's, that's basically what you're saying to God. When you, when you get to that point of, of desperation where you're desperate for God to do something, something in your life and you want a breakthrough in your life and that's why it's important that sometimes we spend time praying and fasting um i recently saw a question on a christian facebook and the question was something like if you could ask one thing of god in prayer what would it be and 90 percent of the people i put things like i want a new car i want a house you know, and I was, I was somewhat dismayed at, at the answers that people were giving, and these were, were from people who said that they were Christians. And I, I, I thought, you know, if, if God asked that question of us, what would the number one thing be in our lives? You know, if I asked that question of you, what would the, the most important thing, if you could ask one thing from God, what would it be in your life? Maybe it's to, you know, to see a family member saved, or maybe it's, it's you want your child to grow up to be a pastor or, or, or something like that. But, you know, I would hope it would not be something selfish. I would hope it would not be something materialistic. But it would be, you know, something like that God would make us into soul winners. Or that God would bring, you know, revival to our town and bring revival to our church. Um, the one thing that Solomon asked of God was that he asked for wisdom. He didn't ask for riches. Well, God did actually make him rich, and Solomon was probably the richest man in the Bible. Uh, so, but if God, if he hadn't asked for wisdom, and if he'd asked for riches, I don't think God would have given him riches. But because his, his heart was in the right place, and he asked for the right thing, then God, then God re, you know, rewarded him. And we as Christians, we should ask for the right things. We shouldn't ask, be asking God for selfish things. Um, so, as I say, you know, we have to have our priorities right. It says in the Bible that God doesn't answer our prayers sometimes because we ask amiss, because we don't ask for the right reasons. The fasting is a way of humbling ourselves before God. We need to humble ourselves before God. And it's also a way of showing self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. That's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And as Christians, we should have self-control. Um, it's a way of showing that God comes first in our lives and not food. So 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24, that's 1 Corinthians 9 verse 24. It says, do you not know that those who run the race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. 
and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now that do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we are an imperishable crown. Therefore run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. So Paul is talking here, he's talking about running the race with perseverance. He's, running, he's talking about running the race to win, to inherit the crown, to, in, to get the prize at the end. And what, what kind of things do we need to, to do that? We need to be dedicated to succeed. We need to have a passion for the game. We need to be single-minded. We need to have a willingness to train every day. You know, spiritually, we are, to, we are called to, you know, train every day. We, we are called spiritually to be dedicated every day and to have a burning desire for the trophy or the crown at the end. And at the moment, uh, the Winter Olympics has just started in South Korea. And those people that are competing will have spent the last months or even years training hard every day. And we as Christians should do the same. We are competing for an even more important prize than what they are competing for. So how much more should we be dedicated? How much more, you know, should we be disciplined? And then it says in verse 27, it says, when I have preached to others, that I myself should not be disqualified. And every time a preacher preaches, I think they should first preach to themselves. Whenever I prepare a message, I always learn something, even if nobody else learns something. I know I learn something from studying the word, and it has to be applied first into our own lives. The preacher has to first of all preach it to themselves before they can preach it to anybody else, because it says that they are not want to be disqualified. So myself, you know, you can preach to other people and they might get something from it, but the preacher themselves does not want to be disqualified. Um, so can we turn to Philippians 3 and verse 17? Philippians 3 verse 17. It says there, brethren, join in following my example and note those who walk as you have seen from our pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven for which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies, that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able, even able to subdue all things to himself. So Paul is talking here about those whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and who set their minds on earthly things. And we as Christians should set our minds on heavenly things and that's one of the things that you do when you fast and when you pray you're setting your minds on heavenly things you're saying that you're more important that you're more interested and that heavenly things are more important than the flesh they're more important than food they're more important than the things of this world and it's a way of showing to god that you're serious about that you really want an answer from god and that you really want to, to see him do something in, in your lives and there are also different kinds of fasting. There's a partial fast where you might fast for part of the day up until, say, um, 6 o'clock. There might be a fast where you fast from certain kinds of food, but you're not fasting completely from food. And then there's another kind of fast where you, you fast from all food, or even some people sometimes fast from food and water. But as I say, you could, you, could, you could only do that for a few days. You would not be able to do it for long. And there are certain people that, you know, should not really fast. Uh, if pregnant women should not fast. Anybody that's on medication, anybody that's <coughs> Ill, Ill should not fast. At least they should not fast unless they've, you know, first spoken to their doctor about it. And, and also possibly uh, anybody that's working, if they're doing a manual job, 
and uh, having to work hard. So, you know, as Christians, we should still use common sense. You know, becoming a Christian doesn't mean that you, you leave your brain at the door. You know, I've heard of people where pastors and different people have prayed and, and they've said to this person, you know, God's healed you. You know, don't take, you don't need to take any more medication. And then that person has got ill or maybe even died and, and that doesn't glorify God. You know, if you believe that God has healed you and God's done something real, then go to your doctor and let your doctor examine you and let it be a witness and a testimony to the doctor that God has really healed you. And then get the x-rays and whatever to, to prove because the skeptics will come along and say, you know, where is your proof that God, that God really healed you? And then you can show them the x-rays or whatever and you can really prove that God has done something. So as Christians, you know, we're not to be stupid. You know, having faith doesn't mean that you're stupid. Before as a Christian, I used to think that uh, Christians were, were stupid people who just believed anything. But that isn't what faith means. Faith is not, is not being, being stupid. Um, so another scripture I'd like us to look at, Joel 2 and verse 1. This is a scripture that uh, Vesta shared with us on Friday night, which was another confirmation that uh, I believe that this is what God is saying to us today. Verse 1 of, of Joel 2 says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. So the, the, when it says that they blew the trumpet, it was a, a ram's horn that was, would be blown. It was a signal of danger. Uh, it was a, a signal of a, a military attack at this time. And then if we look, go on to verse 13, um, from verse, actually, yeah, from verse 13 it says, So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave blessing behind him and grain offering and drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in, in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred as assembly, gather the people, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babes, let the bri bridegroom go out from the chamber and his bride from the dressing room. Let the priests and the ministers to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your inherit heritage to reproach, that the nations shall rule <coughs> over them. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? So this was a scripture that Vesta read on Friday night at the Throne of Grace, and I think it's an important scripture, and that more people need to hear what she was sharing with us on, on Friday night. And he's saying there that to call a fast, which as a church, this is what we are doing at this time. Uh, we're going through a period of pr praying and fasting. So I believe it's very biblical. I believe that's what God wants us to do as a church. And then it's saying in verse 13 that we are to rend our hearts and not just our garments. And this is what Jesus was talking about all the time. He was saying not to just have an outward appearance of religion, but if God looks at the heart, he looks at our hearts to see if we're really rendering our hearts, if we're really mourning, you know, because it's one thing to, to rend your garments, but God wants to wants sincerity, God wants us to be really committed, he wants us to see that it, we're really, you know, that we're being true, God, God wants truth in the inward parts. And then, if we can go on to verse 23, it says, I'm not sure if that's the right one actually. Um, from verse 25 it can read, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God. He who has dwelt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am the midst of Israel, I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. And my people shall never be put to shame. And I believe today that there is somebody here that the locusts 
have eaten your fruit in your life and there's been maybe even years where the locusts have eaten and you've been in a kind of a, a wilderness situation and I believe that God is saying today that he wants to take you out of that and he wants the word of the Lord to come to you again a second time today and so that he will take you out of that because God can send his word to a person a second time even after years of the consuming locusts, of the locusts eating the fruit that you might think that you've spent year, years, wasted years that God could have been using you. But I believe that it's a word for somebody here today that God is saying that he's, you know, he's going to restore you. It's something that we've already touched on in the meeting today, that God is wanting to restore somebody today. He wants to bring them to back to a place of repentance and do something new Amen. in their lives. Amen. And I just want to, to, to tell a, a short story about a guy who uh, used to take drugs and uh, he, he became a Christian and he got saved. And while he was taking drugs, I'm not sure exactly what happened to him, but he ended up losing two fingers. And I think it was because of some complications because of the drugs. And after he became a Christian, he prayed to God and he said he wanted God to heal him, he wanted to, to have his fingers back again. And God said to him, you know, he asked God, why, why do you not restore this to me? And he said to him, he wanted it to be there as a reminder of the sin and for him to never go back into that lifestyle again. You know, sin can leave a scar sometimes in our lives. And so, but sometimes there's things that happen in our lives in our past and maybe it's still there with us. But God can restore us, but sometimes there might be a reason why God is not taking that away from us. Maybe it's because he wants it as a reminder so that we never go back to that again. So we never go back to that lifestyle again. And then it says in verse 28, just to come back to that scripture again, it says that God will pour out his spirit in the last days. In these very last days, God will pour out his spirit again upon all flesh. And this is actually is what's happened in the last hundred years. You know, up until about hundred years ago, I think it was about 60% of all Christians were in Europe and America. And there was hardly any Christians in Africa or Asia or South America. But now the majority of Christians are actually, they're in Africa they're in Asia and they are in South America. And so God has been pouring out his spirit upon all flesh in these last times all around the world. And it says that your sons and your daughters will, will, will prophesy. And we need to pray that for our sons and daughters that they will prophesy. You know, the Bible says that to speak in tongues and that if we speak in tongues that we should interpret but it also said that prophecy is more important than speaking in tongues. Not that we shouldn't speak in tongues, but that if we do speak in tongues, that we should pray that we should interpret those tongues. So we need to pray for our sons and our daughters that they will prophesy and they will speak in tongues and they, they will be able to interpret tongues because that's what God says he will do in the last days. So to wrap up and in conclusion, fasting should be done for the right reasons. Uh, this should be done it privately, not in public, not as the Pharisees did, so that when we are fasting, nobody should know about it. And there are things that only, so, some things that can only be broken by prayer and fasting. So if there's something that you've been struggling with all your life, maybe God is calling you to, for a period of prayer and fasting, where you seek him with all your heart. And then we, we learn from reading Daniel that the answer can be given straight away. And I believe that often is what happens. But then there is an unseen battle in the heavenlies and that the answer can be held up for weeks or months or even years sometimes. And that when we pray and fast, you know, we have to show that God that we are serious with God. You know, being a Christian, it's not a hobby. It's not just something that you do on a Sunday. If you're really a Christian, it has to be every day of our lives. It can't just be something that we just do on Sundays and turn up on a Sunday and then the rest of the week we just do whatever we want, we want to do. We need to humble ourselves in praying and fasting. 
we are living in increasingly in a society that is full of temptation. You know, years ago there would have been no McDonald's, there would have been no KFC, and yet now today we live in a, in a society that food is, is abundant and there's lots of temptation around us. And I think that makes it even more important that we should spend time sometimes fasting and seeking God. And maybe, as I've said, there's something in your, your life that you've been trying to get free from, a bondage or something or an addiction, and maybe only through prayer and fasting can you get free from that addiction. You know, we need to be like Jacob. He wrestled with God and he would not let God go until God blessed him. And he wrestled with God all night. It says that a man was there and he would not let God go of him. And as Christians, we need to wrestle with God in prayer and fasting and not let go of God until he has blessed us. And if we show that kind of determination, if we show that kind of dedication to God, and we say to God, God, I will not let you go until you bless me, until you do that thing in my life that you said you would do, then he will not let us go, and he will bless us. Amen.